Okay, welcome everybody. Buenos dias. Um, welcome to um, this event, which is run, I think, jointly between the All Parliamentary Group on uh, Global LGBT Rights uh, and Stonewall. And today is our event that we are celebrating by visibility uh, with. So welcome to you all. Um, one of the things which our All Parliamentary Group uh, endeavours to do and takes very seriously uh, is not just bringing people of different political parties and opinions together in order to advance the cause of uh, justice and equality for LGBTI people, but we also try to enable those initials to have an increasingly uh, good dialogue between themselves uh, because something that uh, we don't often have or often don't have within our community we think we do but we don't and we rather think it's important to do that so it's really good today to be to be focusing on one of our initials uh, my name is Baroness Barker I'm the Baroness Barker thank you very much uh, and I'm one of the co-founders of the group I'm going to be chair for our session today I'm joined by Nancy Kelly. Some of you will have met Nancy, the others will not. Nancy is the new chief executive of Stonewall and she previously worked at uh, the National Centre for Social Research and did a lot of work on LGBT issues and public attitudes to them uh, there. And Hafsa Qureshi, who is um, Stonewall's co-chair of the Bi Staff Network Group, and she is an award-winning member of staff in that capacity. So welcome to her. And our third speaker later on is Alex Hernandez, who's director and coordinator of for research for Math uh, Igualdad um, from Peru. Yes, well, got that That's right. Well done. Yeah. Go over. I was close, wasn't I? Not close enough, but I was close. Okay. Uh, um, partner in Stonewalls uh, at the Margins Network. So what we're going to do is I'm going to leave, it, take it over to you three to talk very briefly for about um, half an hour in total, and then we will open it up to comments and questions. And comments and questions we will uh, hope that you will take, uh, you will put in the spirit of generosity with which this event is held. So over to you, Nancy, go. Um, so myself and Hafsa are going to present some data and some reflections on our BI report. Um, my name's Nancy, uh, I'm the Chief Exec of Stonewall and my pronouns are she and her. Uh, my name is Hafsa, uh, my pronouns are she and her and I'm a Client Account Manager at Stonewall. Next slide please Eloise. So firstly, a little bit briefly about the report. So in 2017, Stonewall commissioned YouGov to carry out a survey with over 5,000 LGBT people across England, Scotland and Wales. And we were really asking people about their experiences in day-to-day -day life. And the report that we're launching today is the final in a series that were based on this research. And this report is really trying to understand what are the specific experiences of people in the bi community. And it highlights some of the persistent challenges that bi people face in every aspect of their lives. We're really only going to talk to you today about some big headline findings. Please do dive into the report as a whole. There's so much there um, for us all to learn from, I think. Next slide, please. So what do we mean by bi? Um, bi is an umbrella term used to describe romantic and or sexual attraction towards more than one gender. Uh, bi people may describe themselves using one or more of a variety of terms, including, but not limited to, bisexual, pan and queer. So that's what we, we mean when we're saying bi throughout this. Um, what is biphobia? Biphobia is a fear or dislike of someone because of prejudice towards or negative attitudes about bi people. Bipho biphobia can be targeted at people who are or who are perceived to be bi as well. Next slide, please. So here we have a quote from Kendra, 32, from Scotland. Being bisexual means finding yourself excluded by gay people and straight people in social settings. I only tell my friends about my sexuality, meaning it is hidden from my family and my work colleagues. Bisexuality is a hidden sexuality through people's lack of acceptance. Uh, next slide, please. So the, one of the first areas we wanted to highlight to you is the idea of bi erasure. So bi people are much less likely to be out in every aspect of their lives, at home, at school, at work, within their faith community than lesbian 
or gay people. And what you can see here is some data that illustrates that. So in our survey, we could see that 63% of gay and lesbian people were out to all of their family compared to just 20% of bi people. And that's kind of a really enormous difference in terms of people's comfort being open in their own homes and in their own families. We also know that bi people's identities are often erased or ignored. Um, there are biphobic assumptions about what LGBT people look like. There are assumptions that are based on um, the gender identity of a person's current partner. And all of these factors play a role in erasing bi people's identity. And again, we saw some of these experiences coming through in our data. It's really important to recognize that bi people experience prejudice and exclusion from lesbian and gay people, not just from straight people. And and you can see some of that here. So 18% of bi men said that they experienced discrimination from other people within the LGBT plus community and 27% of bi women reported experiencing discrimination from others within our community and that that level of, of exclusion and ex discrimination is far far higher than it is for gay men or for lesbians. Next slide please. So what does this mean for being bi in the workplace? Um, our findings reveal that many bi staff don't feel safe disclosing their identity at work. And often those who do experience discrimination and abuse with incidents ranging from offensive language from customers to being outed at work without their consent. Um, so we have here some really keynote uh, stats. So 41% of gay and lesbian staff would feel confident reporting being a victim of bullying or harassment versus 28% of bi staff and 57% of gay and lesbian staff um, are out to everyone they work with versus 22% of bi staff. Um, and I think these statistics really highlight the difference between the way homophobia manifests to the way biphobia can manifest. Um, and it can also lead into people who feel perhaps more comfortable talking to their coworkers and maybe identifying as lesbian or straight just in that workplace instead of talking about their bi identity because it feels safer or they feel they're at less risk of biphobia or um, people making assumptions about them or their partner. Next slide, please. So another major area where we can see those kinds of experiences of discrimination and exclusion is in access to healthcare. LGBT people experience discrimination and lack of understanding and inclusion around their health needs when they're accessing healthcare of all kinds. And bi people are no exception to that. They often too have their own specific health needs overlooked and that can undermine trust in their healthcare provider. And so what you can see here again is a really big difference in terms of the experiences of the bi community. We can see that 40% of bi men aren't out to anyone when they're seeking medical care and that's compared to 10% of gay men and when we look at bi women we can see that 29% so just under a third of bi women aren't out to anyone when they're seeking medical care compared to just 11% of lesbians so again we see these just really big differences in terms of the way in which people are able to engage with their healthcare providers. And this can also manifest um, in terms of misogyny or people being um, shamed for their sexual activity or perceived sexual activity as well. Um, and this also leads to that bi erasure and biphobia. For example, if a bi man, uh, bi man is seeking medical care in terms of PrEP, um, when it comes to HIV prevention, um, they may feel it's easier to talk about themselves as a gay man instead of a bi man for fear of reproach or um, assumptions being made about their sexual life and their relationships as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the final area we really wanted to highlight from the survey was around bi communities experience of both hate crime and violence. So we know that the bi community face really unacceptably high levels of abuse, harassment and discrimination. And I think it's really important to recognise that people from the bi community are at greater risk than lesbian and gay people of experience, experiencing sexual violence and experiencing domestic abuse. And on top of that greater risk, it can be less obvious where they can safely access support um, than it is for lesbian and gay members of our community. So one of the things that we asked in our survey was about um, people's experience of hate incidents in the, in the year prior to the data being collected. So 
what we found for by respondents is in the year prior to the survey, um, what they experienced in terms of hate and hate crime and, and discrimination that's being driven by their sexual orientation or their perceived sexual orientation is that just under a third, 31% of by respondents told us that they were insulted, pestered, intimidated, harassed over the course of the last year. Extremely high, 13% experienced unwanted sexual con um, contact, 9% were threatened with violence. And, and here you can see very high numbers. So 6% were physically assaulted because of with biphobic motivation. So very serious, very significant experience also, interpersonal violence. Oh, sorry, Nancy. Um, uh, often when we talk about bi identities, uh, we get a response, well, being bi isn't as visible as other identities may seem. Um, first and foremost, you don't know if someone is bi unless they tell you. Um, but secondly, um, that is not always the case. Um, if someone is perceived to be straight and is actually bi, um, sometimes people who um, share hateful views might feel more comfortable sharing those views with those people. Um, I've actually had direct experience where um, I identify as a bi Muslim woman and uh, I'm often read as straight and I hear lots of comments that maybe other people don't get to be privy to, which is not a privilege um, I really enjoy. Um, but that is definitely a huge uh, issue, as well as um, when we look at unwanted sexual contact, um, some of the stereotypes and assumptions around bi people, uh, sometimes often around bi women, are that you know bi women are more sexually active, are perhaps just more interested in uh, experimenting and all sorts of things. And whether or not someone is or isn't, these assumptions should not be made based on someone's sexual orientation. Um, and uh, we often see sort of messages and things where um, people feel they can invite someone who's bi into their relationship without necessarily considering that person's feelings, their emotions, and how they feel as an individual. Um, and instead, bi people can sometimes be treated more as, um, as badges instead of actual people. Um, and that's really a huge, huge issue that I think um, a lot of bi people may have anecdotal experience of um, receiving sort of um, difficult messages or um, uncomfortable contact uh, online or in person. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, here we have a quote from Asha, who's 21 from the Northwest. Remember that it's not just white, cis, abled people who are LGBT+. I'm an Arab, ex-Muslim, autistic, mentally ill, poor brown girl who is also bi. No LGBT plus people support me or accommodate me. I am invisible to you. Um, this quote really um, resonated with me um, as an openly bi Muslim woman. Um, despite working for Stonewall and awards for the work that I've done, I'm still often read as straight. Um, even when I talk about the work that I do, this is not uncommon to other bi people of color or bi people of faith or anyone sort of within those marginalized communities that aren't represented when it comes to mainstream perceptions of what bi identities look like. And it's really important to recognize that. Um, next slide, please. There we go. So I think we've just highlighted some of the main areas in terms of bi erasure, um, by experiences in the workplace, of healthcare, hate crime and discrimination. Um, but please do read the full report and kind of, uh, and, and dig into some of the rich data there. Thank you very much indeed. A <clears throat> um, lot to think about in that. Uh, would love to now um, move over to Alex. Alex, as we said, works uh, with Math Equalidad in Peru. And a lot of her research looks at mental uh, health issues and uh, by people in Peru. Alex, over to you, please. Thank you, thank you. Well, my pronouns are she and her also. Um, thank you for, for this opportunity to speak about the Out of the Margins project and about the challenges of bi plus people, especially women, non-binary and trans people in our study. Um, this study has given us the opportunity to start the conversation around mental health and the need to ban conventional therapies. I'm sorry. Um, my research project uh, revolves around LGBTQ mental health, and I was able to analyze uh, the main mental health struggles and the services LGBTQ people go to 
the prejudice that exist in mental health professionals of, and of course, the practices uh, of conversion or conversion therapies. Um, we also identify the situation of violence and discrimination suffered by, by LGBTQ people. Uh, for this opportunity, I have brought the information only concerning by plus people. Um, the study analyzed the experiences of 137 bisexual and pansexual people, which we grouped together because we found no differences between the two, two groups. Uh, the majority were cis women, nearly 60%, uh, followed by 25%, 26% uh, that were trans and non-binary bi people, and only 15% were cis men. Uh, well, also the majority of non-binary uh, gender indi individuals throughout the study identify themselves as bi plus, and no trans feminine or trans women reported uh, bisexual orientation. Almost 80% of bisexual people reported having suffered some type of violence. 63 suffered from psychological violence and about 20% sexual violence and physical violence. We have even had by, by women tell us their psychotherapist was the perpetrator of sexual violence, such as harassment and unconsented kisses or groping. Um, in addition, 70% of bisexuals reported having suffered from biphobia or discrimination for being bisexual. These results indicate that uh, biphobia is a form of discrimination that exists, even though on many occasions it is considered that bi people do not suffer discrimination. We also looked at, at the mental health problems. In the case of bi people, the most increased mental health problems compared to homosexuals and lesbians were personality disorders such as borderline personality and anxiety symptoms. Approximately 60% uh, of bisexuals in our study reported having symptoms of anxiety, depression, and low self-esteem, followed by diagnosis of bipolar disorder in 20% of the sample, post-traumatic stress in about 70%, um, like I said, borderline personality in 12%, and alcohol and substance abuse in about 10% of the sample. These are all higher levels than those of the general population and in many cases higher than reported uh, by gays and lesbians, as has been shown in many other studies and reports. In our study, only 50% of the bisexuals reported not having frequent mental health symptoms, meaning 85% of bi people struggle at least with one mental health problem frequently. When bi people have uh, these mental health issues, they, uh, the majority do go to mental health professionals who work in public hospitals or private practices. When faced with the mental health professional, almost 35% of the sample reported having heard the prejudice, bisexuality is a face, and 12% heard the phrase bisexuals are unfaithful while they were being attended. Um, this is very important because uh, many bisexuals uh, do need mental health care due to the high rates we have seen, but when faced with prejudice uh, on the part of health personnel, they do not receive adequate attention, and this can affect also the adherence to the treatment. In general, 61% of the bisexuals consider that when they have visit uh, mental health service, the psychologists and psychiatrists have not been properly trained to be able to attend them in terms of sexual diversity and gender approach. In addition, I, I have to say uh, that part of the mental health project in this phase is to build a national database of affirmative mental health professionals that will be launched in a couple of weeks. Uh, first, with it, uh, uh, you know, our, our first screening consisted in, of an online questionnaire we presented the psychologists and psychiatrists a list of prejudices, and I have to say sadly that most, uh, the most frequent prejudices, even among so-called professionals, affirmative professionals, and so-called uh, gay-friendly professionals, were about bisexual and also about trans people. Uh, this information is key to understand why bi people can and often do not feel secure in so-called gay-friendly spaces or even under the care of inclusive or affirmative health services. 
In our study, uh, we were surprised by the number of LGBTQ people who reported having ever suffered some kind of conversion therapy. In the case of bi people, about 30% acknowledged having ever attended one of the therapies, which in Peru are not prohibited or sanctioned. Of this group, more than 50% were taken to these therapies while they were under uh, 18 and 30% while they were uh, under 25, meaning 80% of conversion practices occur while bi people are young and are still developing you know, their personalities and their brains. Uh, one of the most important findings of our study is that PTSD uh, was found associated with conversion therapy. So for the people we surveyed, uh, PTSD may be a consequence of attending one of these practices. Uh, you know, violence and discrimination do have an impact in our mental health. So uh, it is not easier to be bi than it is to be gay or lesbian. It is a different experience and a truly diverse one. So we have to start listening to, to bi people and producing reports like this and memories like this uh, that center our experiences in order to advocate for our well-being. Thank you. Sorry, the curse of 2020, I un unmute myself. Um, I, um, thank you very much. Could everybody um, put the questions into chat, uh, please? And people who are helping to moderate us will, uh, our session will, will help us pick, pick those out. Um, we've got a half, just over half an hour to, to talk this through. I wonder if I might um, uh, kick off by asking uh, all of you uh, one, one question. Why do you think, even within the community, our own community, like, let's just go with our own community at the moment, why do you think that there is uh, such misunderstanding and um, uh, consequent mistreatment of bi people? Um, I'll, I'll go first if that's okay. Um, I think there's a mixture of things and I'm going to be really vague and say there's no easy answer, but I think from my experience, there's a mix of, um, you know, you don't understand our experience as lesbian and gay people. Um, there's an assumption that bi people can go under the radar, can marry appropriately, quote unquote, um, by marrying um, an opposite sex partner or a partner who's perceived to be opposite sex um, and therefore no longer be perceived as bi. Um, whereas gay and lesbian people may not have those opportunities available to them. And I think there's so much um, deep-rooted homophobia and amidst that biphobia and transphobia in this very cisgender heteronormative society that um, it kind of manifests in these ways where um, even other LG people are saying to bi people that you need to pick a side, um, that you, your identity is not valid because there is no point of flux for them. Uh, for some people, they are very definitive in their sexual orientation uh, or their gender identity, for example. Um, and whereas bi identities might be perceived as more of a state of flux or unfortunately a phase. Um, and I think that's definitely a perception we need to challenge consistently. And I'm glad we have that research to do so. Um, but that's just my sort of opinion on that. Thank you. Uh, others want to come in? Yeah, I would like to say something. Uh, sometimes we forget that uh, our experience is not only a public experience, but it's also an internal experience, as we have seen when we talk about mental health. So by people, you know, like me, for example, we do have a very uh, diverse experience uh, uh, that we, we have to go through all of this. I, I'm really glad uh, you did this by report because we don't have enough data to support it. And lesbian and gay, especially activists, I think uh, they need to start uh, giving us a space to talk about our experiences. We do. We need to start uh, listening to bi people talk about what they feel, how it is to be bi. And of course, bisexuality is really diverse, like really diverse. We do have people in some space on the spectrum. So uh, it is very rich and we have to start talking about sexuality as it is, as a spectrum, as as it's complex also. I just really want to kind of um, 
as lesbian, right? So <laughs> I'm not bi, which is why I was hopefully giving space for Hafsa and Alex to speak speak for their own community and themselves, right? There's something for me that's really striking about um, the data that Alex was representing around the commonalities that you see in trans people's mental health and in bi people's mental health, which actually you do see reflected in other studies. And one of the things that I really wo wonder about there is this business around the kind of trauma of not being perceived as valid um, and, and a lot of the things that Hafsa and Alex have been pointing to, a lot of the things that the data points to in both studies, is the way in which biphobia, including from people like me within the community, including from lesbians and from gay men, um, is really about your identity not being valid and not on a fundamental level being respected. And I do really wonder about that in terms of how it then feeds through into those mental health outcomes. Okay. Uh, I wonder if I might pick up about um, a point about the statistics that you have uh, shown up in the report are, are really truly uh, awful. They're, they're truly appalling. And I think that many people who are in the community but are not by, were they to know that, would desperately want to, 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 to help you to check, you know, to, to be part of a force for good for change. What's the key things that, that people sh within the community should do to help you to support, support you in the change that you're trying to, to bring about? And this is a shameless plug, but Stonewall's shared quite a lot of to be a really good bi ally, which um, and lots of other organizations did last week for Bi Visibility Week. So I would really just kind of encourage people to access those resources, whether through Stonewall or elsewhere. And there really kind of there is a lot of material from other and us and other organizations about how to be more bi inclusive in the workplace, how to be more bi inclusive in schools, etc. I mean, there, there are a lot of resources out there with LGBT organizations, including but not only Stonewall. So I kind of really would advocate for people to reach out and access all of those. Okay. Yeah, and uh, as an addendum to what Nancy has just added, um, it's great to have a work a workplace where you can feel comfortable to be yourself. But if you find out or your coworker tells you that they are bi, please do not take that as an invitation to then ask them questions about um, their body or their partners or their sex life or the romantic history. Um, just as you would not have these conversations in the workplace, um, please understand that if someone is, is, is being open with you, whether they're bi or trans, non-binary, or um, otherwise in the LGBT plus community, um, they do not represent every single person in the community. And although we at Stonewall obviously want to share experiences and have this conversation here, um, just sort of using platforms like social media to, to hear the stories of people without necessarily reaching out to you know, the person that sits next to you at work who may not really want to talk about it. Um, so I would definitely recommend uh, looking uh, on social media, Twitter, for example. Um, there's a really fantastic group called Vise of Colour that are definitely worth checking out. This is Biscuit to do fantastic work. Um, Buy Pride as well. Uh, there are lots of groups. So I'm probably going to miss someone out, but I definitely recommend just doing a quick Google search um, and looking at the great work that's already out there and our Buy Report. <laughs> Thank you. Alex? Yeah, I quickly wanted to add uh, that in, in Peru and Latin America, this year has been like a year of awakening for bisexual people. And we have started uh, organizing. Um, this is actually the first year that an event has been held uh, that exclusively convened bisexual people. It was organized by, by Pride Peru, which is of which I am part also, and the LGBT network, an organization from Arequipa, Peru. And this was not only the first event of its kind, but it was decentralized, which means not only people from Lima, the capital, participated as something that is extremely difficult in a country like Peru. So virtuality has helped us come closer. Um, this event and other events that were held in Peru, Chile, Mexico, Argentina, and other Latin American countries are like the first stones towards a real by possibility in the construction of bisexual memory. I, I, I had the opportunity to be in London three years ago, precisely uh, on Bi Possibility Day, and I was fascinated by the number of events and bisexual organizations that were held in activities for the day, in addition to the artistic and academic and scientific production that exists on our sexual orientation. So 
I think this level of organization is what we is 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 what allows us to to build agendas and to agree on agendas and manage uh, the building of safe spaces and the advocate to improve the lives of five people. And and it's the force that we need to reclaim uh, spaces that have been denied us over time. So. I think in, in Latin America, we're beginning to organize and make our experiences more visible to create the memories that we need. And I am grateful for the opportunity today and be able to make it visible. This important information about the situation of my people. Questions come up in the, the chat. What do you see as the links or parallels between biphobia, transphobia and racism? I suppose, what are the challenges that they present for our community? Let's put it like that. Who wants to go first? I'll just say what, what I failed to say properly in the chat, which is I think that the question was really trying to understand are there like similarities with these other forms of oppression that are really enforcing binary or like narrow categorizations and like instinctively that seems to me that that is right, that part of the dynamic of biphobia that both Alex and Hafta have really pointed to is this kind of rejection of complexity and fluidity and change and diversity and all of those kinds of things. So kind of instinctively, it seems to me that there, there is a lot of kind of commonality. And of course, in th those, those forms of oppression also intersect and kind of are experienced in the lives and the bodies of uh, by people of colour and trans by people of colour, right? But, it, uh, you know, I think your insight seems sensible to me. Alex, Alex and Hafsa have got probably a much better take on it than I do, but... Um, I think, for me, um, one thing that can occur sometimes within sort of bi communities and uh, sort of cis communities, perhaps, is the policing of gender identity and of sexual orientation and people gatekeeping what they define bisexual or bi to mean or not defining it as an umbrella for example um, and what trans means as an example. I do think biphobia and transphobia manifest in different ways and in fact someone who is trans can still also experience biphobia unfortunately but I do think there is solidarity between the two communities. There was a fantastic um, uh, hashtag initiative that went around um, called Be With The T um, about bi communities um, supporting the trans community um, and I think there's often a discourse that bi means two and therefore gender is binary. Um, of course, that's nonsense, um, if you don't mind me saying politely. Um, uh, and, you know, just the perception that uh, we are forced into these, these roles. And um, as Nancy said, uh, there's no compassion or understanding for fluidity. And I do hope that that will will stop <laughs> and that will be uh, disseminated um, and when it comes to, to racism I think that is part and parcel of every facet of our lives um, which sounds dramatic but I don't think it is um, and I think uh, as Audrey Lord said the master's tools will not uh, dismantle the house um, so I think we need to dismantle that uh, racist society and organizational structure before we can even comprehend the detrimental impact it's had and how to overcome that and I think um, five minutes is not really like the remit for that, but that's just my sort of two cents on that. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to say that um, the history of LGBTQ activism has consistently erased our identities and contributions. Uh, proof of that is the erasure of the bisexuality of Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, you know, which were crucial to the celebration and manifestation of the pride. And there were also trans women of color uh, and we have had uh, trans exclusionary radical feminists, feminists excluding trans people and also bi people from the discussion. And I think we have a lot to learn from trans activism. We need to keep reclaiming our spaces and reclaim a history that has been neglected from us. Uh, bi people have always been here. We must remember that the modern concepts of homosexuality and gender in terms of men and women come from a very binary and unrealistic tradition. Um, there are tons of references of how gender and sexuality was seen and understood in our cultures and spaces. Uh, we also have to demystify science uh, and its concepts on sexuality and gender and sex and do a better science that is inclusive of this other experiences like 
bisexuality, like pansexuality, trans, um, that seem uh, to be majoritarian, of course, and don't fit this, this strict binary. Thank you very much. Um, I happen to have the great honour to be the uh, patron of uh, Opening Doors uh, and therefore it's, so it's really nice that to pick up a message in the chat from Ian Dodds that he's now um, of the age or the generation that Opening Doors uh, seeks to exist and he's been out as a bisexual man for, uh, for over 50 years and has been telling his story uh, which has been very well received. Following on from that in the research, you talked a lot about uh, bi people and the terrible experiences that they had at work. What, um, I suppose, from Stonewall's corporate point of view, or from you as uh, individuals, what do you think can be done to improve uh, the situation at work uh, for bi people? Because I think a lot of employers have a commitment to that. What is it that we need them to do? So, I mean, from the kind of work that we do in the workplace are measuring employers in terms of how well they respond to the need of their by community within their workplace and within their customer base or their suppliers. Um, and we're also with, with our diversity champions, we do a lot of work to support um, workplaces to be more bi inclusive. And so that's something about at a really basic level, making sure that all of the institutional policies are bi inclusive, not bi phobic in their nature, that there are internal employee groups for bi members of staff, and that there's kind of celebration of kind of key moments such as bi visibility weeks. So there's a lot of kind of doing the basics well, that we support employers to do. And I think that we then some you know, where there's a need where, where we're working with an employer, where they recognize that they, they've got a kind of longer journey to go, then we do more kind of bespoke work around helping them tackle specific instances of biphobia or specific challenges within their workplace. But I'm a great, I'm a great believer in doing some of the basics really, really well. And I think one of the things that can happen, and I guess this points to um, some of the comments um, just generally about kind of lesbian and gay centrism, is that there's a tendency when we think about LGBT inclusion as an employer to really be thinking about lesbian and gay inclusion and not thinking so much about bi people and not thinking so much about trans people. So I think there's something about really challenging employers to think about all of our communities and all of the diversity within those communities that is very important. Okay, Hafsa? Um, I don't have a pleasant answer to this, um, but I think uh, we often tend to group, I mean we literally have an acronym LGBT and everyone just kind of gets grouped together and we don't really take apart the different forms of bigotry, oppression and hatred that form from that and I think it's deeply important to recognize how both biphobia manifests as well as transphobia, but we're focusing on biphobia today, unfortunately, um, how that manifests um, and also allowing people the opportunity to not engage if they feel that the workplace is not thinking about them as bi people. You need to hear that feedback. Um, I think I completely agree with Nancy that people, uh, organizations should be doing the small things well, um, but I think part of that is also listening to feedback from those communities that says, actually, you're not doing this as well as you think you were. Um, and I think that can be incredibly hard for people to hear, especially um, in diversity inclusion, when people are quite tied to that work personally, um, either as allies or LGBT people themselves. But I think it's really vital to step back and listen to the people of those identities that are telling you how they feel within your organization. Um, for example, if you're uh, advertising, uh, sorry, discussing um, by Visibility Week and the bi people within your organization are not resonating with it, it's time to stop and ask why that's the case. Because I think a one size fits all approach does not work when it comes to inclusion, in my opinion. And I think it's important to speak to those um, employees and not just those that work in diversity inclusion, not just those that are on board level, but your junior employees who will face uh, potentially a lot more than senior level might when it comes to public uh, discrimination or issues within the workplace. I mean, that is an assumption, but uh, I do think it's important to listen at every level in your workplace, um, how people are experiencing biphobia, homophobia or transphobia uh, within the workplace. Alexa, anything from uh, employer working with employers in Peru? 
No, I agree with Nancy and Hapla. I think you need to start asking your Baha'i people how they want to celebrate or, or make an impact or advocate. Uh, because uh, when you start assuming, uh, you will probably, um, be because the, the Baha'i experience is so diverse, uh, maybe when you start, when you talk about homosexuality and, and you show like love is love and, and same as sex couples, you know, as a way to make sure everyone, you know, is on board with same sex couples, for example, or marriage equality, uh, but maybe for bisexuals, uh, even though same sex partnerships are, of course, something that uh, we can experience and, and we want to validate, maybe some of our experiences uh, need to be validated, maybe, for example, in my case, when I talk about mental health, for me, this is a way we, you can start uh, showing by people that you respect them by centering their mental health, for example. That could be one, one thing that you can do. Let's uh, take that as a, as a reason to go on to the next issue that somebody's raised, which is about mental health and about training for mental health professionals. Clearly, it's an issue. It's an issue right across all of the initials. We know that now. But in particular, what sort of training do you think mental health professionals need so that they can properly meet the needs of by people? I, I, like I said in my presentation, it was sad for me when I were interviewing also these uh, health, mental health professionals and asking them about their answers in our first screening when they, you know, we presented these, all of these lists of common beliefs around LGBT people. And they did really well when asking about lesbians or you know, homosexuals, like they, re they did really well. And when faced with uh, these common uh, assumptions around bisexuality, they failed uh, drastically. So I was asking them and, and they never learned about bisexuality. They, they thought that if they knew all about a, the uh, homosexuality or, or yeah, they, they thought that if they knew how to treat a lesbian or a homosexual, they will inherently know how to treat by people and uh, it was really uh, it was saddening for me but we have to cut some of these people to ensure that our project really because we're doing this uh, database and directory that was, is going to be held in our website so anyone in Peru can access to our website and find a really affirmative health mental health professional that can take care of their needs so I needed to make sure that everyone was on board also uh, around bisexuality and, and trans people and non-binary people. Most of the people that didn't know how to treat bisexual didn't know also how to treat bi uh, non-binary people. And I don't think this is like a coincidence because uh, bi and non-binary people, we are challenging this uh, concept of the binary of men, women, of homosexuals and straight people. So it is not, uh, just a coincidence and we need to start working more on how to dismantle this patriarchy in terms also in terms of dismantling the binary. Hafsa? I uh, completely agree with uh, everything Alex has said. I think um, the concept of fluidity is not something that's really as discussed as it should be, um, not only when it comes to sexual orientation but gender identity as well. Um, the fact that non-binary identities have existed for a very long time and yet still being treated as a very new conversation shows that lack of education, that lack of visibility when it comes to fluidity um, and these conversations in more depth. Um, and I think there's also a conversation to be had. Uh, I'm not a mental health professional, so please do take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, but there is a conversation to be had around kind of bi conversion therapy. Um, my experience sort of within South Asian communities um, has been as a bi person being told that I can just marry the right person um, and not be bi anymore, um, which obviously isn't true. Um, but it's that that issue that being bi can be cured in an easier way, in a more palatable way than perhaps being lesbian, gay or trans. And obviously I do not condone that LGBT people can be cured. We are who we say we are, but I think this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, 
and also the process of someone perhaps exploring their sexual orientation, maybe talking about their bi, uh, their bi identities, there's a question of, um, does a therapist help them explore that um, and not necessarily pushing them towards, this is a phase you are either clearly gay or clearly straight, but also not prohibiting that person from expressing themselves because they may reach a point where they don't identify as bi. Um, and I can't say I really have an answer to that as I'm not a mental health professional, but I do think we need more research, we need more data. Um, and it's fantastic we have some now, but it is disappointing that it's taken so long just to get to this point. Um, and there's just been a dearth of research and I think we just need more of it. I, I really wonder if I could just kind of build up some of what I have to say about conversion therapy because I think it's so important, right? So we have a moment right now where the government's committed to ending conversion therapy and it's really critical that that, that applies to buy people and is banned and ended in a way that makes sense. And one of the things that comes across quite clearly um, in the stories that buy people tell about their experience of conversion therapy is that it can also be about bad therapy, which kind of links, I guess, the idea of kind of courses of treatment, what we think of as conversion therapy that are designed to change someone's sexuality or their gender identity and what both Hafsa and Alex are pointing to, which is biphobia within the context of routine therapy or counselling um, relationships can mean that your counsellor that you're seeing for your anxiety is attempting to make you straight or make you gay, right? So I think there's a kind of unique aspect of the intersection between, if you like, formal conversion therapy and poor therapy that's actually biphobic and abusive of bi people, because it's attempting to kind of raise this kind of very biphobic idea of phase, you know, a phase or lack of clarity, but can be just as traumatic for bi people as sort of deliberate conversion therapy. Um, th thanks for that. But um... Nancy, I, let me share with you one of my private gripes. Every year I turn up to Pride and I see all these medical organisations, you know, the BMA, the GMC, out for Pride. And my heart, I have to really screw up my hands. Like, yeah, where are you the other 364 days of the year? You know, I'm delighted you're here. Now, the rainbow badge uh, in the NHS, I, I think, is a great grassroots uh, uh, initiative. Um, um, I just wish that the Secretary of State for Health would take the badge off until such time as he understands what it's supposed to represent. But, but, I, but I do come back to this point about how do we make sure that people in the health service and how do we make sure that LGBT people within the health service are empowered to call out bad practice, to deliver the good standards such as the LGBT foundation, you know, pride in practice and all that stuff that we've been putting together for years. What is it that we now need to do to push that to make sure that it becomes the reality that we face in the NHS rather than the exception? I love that question. It's a tough one. I'll give it a go. So I think this is where it's about working across the movement to really hold the professional associations feet to the fire. Right. And doing that in a really coordinated way. And one of the areas that as we're developing our new strategy at Stonewall, we've really started to focus on is health and mental health and kind of understanding where is it that we can stand with LGBT Foundation, who would you say do the fantastic pride in practice with Opening Doors, who do fantastic work in social care for LGBT elders and with um, MindOut and etc. And how can we stand together as a movement collectively and with key leaders such as yourself to get not just the kind of the, the NHS structures and, and the trusts that, for instance, we might work with, but all of these professional associations, so BMA, Royal College of Psychiatrists, etc., and really kind of hold their feet to the fire around what good looks like and what is acceptable for LGBT communities or in the context of today's conversation, what is acceptable, what is good enough um, for them to say that they've got a service that's fit to meet the needs of bi people. So I think there's something about really pulling together all of that fantastic work and working together to sort of set to really push and set a bar um, 
Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, the disparities in terms of mental health between LGBT people and cis and straight people are shocking and unacceptable. And part of the problem is that mainstream society has come to just not be shocked and not be um, to be accepting of it. And I think it's for us as a movement to, to work together to really challenge that level of acceptance. Alex, do you have um, anything to add from your experience in Peru? Well, um, yeah, I mean, in Peru, we're like taking the first steps uh, in advocacy in surrounding mental health. Uh, but uh, I think, like I said, we have a lot, a lot to learn from trans activism because trans people have organized to advocate for themselves in these spaces like health, for example, no? like, and so, um, I don't know, I, I think sometimes by activists like myself, uh, this internalized by phobia, this, this like, sometimes we don't raise our voices as we should. Uh, so a space like this, is an opportunity to start talking and make a dialogue and, and say, hey, bisexuality is important. This is going to empower us. This is empowering me right now. And it's, it's, been, it's been happening like this for the past two years. I wasn't this uh, visible uh, like two or three years ago. So for me, uh, this is like a, a space with no return. I'm going to advocate even more. And there is a lot of uh, bisexual activists in Latin America and in Peru also. And we are trying to come together to advocate so going to the health sphere and start talking about how you don't, you don't have to assume someone's uh, sexual orientation or gender identity and you have to ask and you have to make sure, you know, this is statistics. So you have, you know what to ask when you uh, are attending a bi, a bi person. And this is really important. And we have to make the protocols for mental health professionals and um, just healthcare uh, spaces they have the protocols to attend by people. So I think this is, we just need to raise our voices even more and, and believe in ourselves and the power that we have when we talk about bisexuality, because we're not just talking about our experiences. We're talking about dismantling a way of see people and sexuality as it whole. So we need to add more complexity when we talk about sexuality. I think um, because I come from, from science background and academic background, which is not, uh, sometimes it's not, not the best way to address these issues when we are an activist. Um, but I have seen how science is a very, sometimes dangerous place for, for LGBT people. We need to start uh, taking this variable, this LGBT variable or gender variable or sexual orientation variable as it as complex as it is. So for me, it's like activists need to raise our voices even more. Okay, I'm going to ask you uh, all one last question. Um, we've got this research, um, which is a, a brilliant starting point uh, with which a brilliant tool with which to raise awareness uh, within the community. Uh, what's the one takeaway that you have? What's the one thing that you would want people, let's start within the community, uh, to do uh, differently to help? Hafsa? Um, a quick one is just start making assumptions. Um, uh, making assumptions about someone based on who they're seeing or um, how they present themselves um, at work or outside of work. If you see someone coming out of a gay club, for example, uh, in the before times, um, not making a, an assumption on their sexuality or their gender identity based on that. Um, and as in Denim, read our bio report, it's great. Um, there's also uh, a list of uh, how to be a good bi ally in there. I think there's there's 10 uh, ways to be a good bi ally. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't plug that, so please do read it. It's uh, great. Um, so yeah, that's it, just not making those assumptions. And if someone doesn't want to talk to you about their bi-identity, respect that. Uh, no one owes you their story. No one owes you an explanation on who they are and what they do. What we want, or at least what I want from this, is to allow people the space to, to talk about these things if they want to, and to, to talk about things without fear of reproach, and to know that they can be accepted for who they are, 
um, regardless of their gender identity or sexual orientation. And it may be that this is something they never want to talk about or something they want to talk about all the time, but that should be their choice. Alex? Yeah, well, I, I often hear that uh, to be bi, uh, it is easier to be bi than gay or lesbian. Um, we, we look at the rates of mental health problems experienced by bi people. It is clear that being bi is has its own challenges and difficulties. Um, we don't have much data on that, but a couple of studies has shown that it might have to do with this lack of sense of belonging to the LGBT communities as well as straight spaces um, and the need uh, to be constantly explaining our sexual orientation. You know, but people assume uh, our sexual orientation and they assume that we are straight as default and assume that we are gay or lesbian whenever we participate in any LGBT community. So this racer does affect our mental health and we need to address this issue. Activists especially need to address this issue and stop making assumptions, I have to say it, and make sure their spaces are really welcoming uh, the Dubai experience and Dubai people. Uh, Nancy, Stonewall's already had a good old plug, so um, if you don't mind, what I would like to say on behalf of the All Parliamentary Group is we are um, uh, crucially aware um, that it is important to get people who make the laws and make the policies uh, to make sure that they understand uh, issues. So please make sure that you, um, that, that you are engaging with the parliamentarians who will listen to you. It's our job to make sure that more parliamentarians around the world will listen to you. Um, and the second thing I would say is um, images are, are incredibly important. Um, images as in role models, I think, uh, particularly when we're trying to represent the diversity of our community. But, Images, even in terms of having our, our rainbow flags that now come in more than one variety that show the sort of uh, diversity of the community uh, as well. Uh, all of those are very, very important and you just have to keep plugging away. Um, go find the allies. There are allies out there in the professions, in the voluntary sector groups. And there are people who are willing to help us with their skills, but always, always be led by the voices of the people who know what life and the lived experience is before you stand up and talk about it publicly. Thank you very much, to Stonewall. Particularly, thank you very much from Alex. We are Brits. We love people who come from Peru, whether they're bears or, pro or humans. Uh, thank you very much for being with us at the time. Thank you very much to everybody who took part in the chat. Go read the report, go get the Stonewall stuff about how to be brilliant for bi people and go make a difference. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.